Okay, in the previous session, uh, we finished about chapter 3, verse 12. I'd like to ask you a question, and I'm indebted to James Dobson for this. When he was at the Council for National Policy, he made a speech that was very impressive. But he opened it with a very interesting question. What is the first thing that God created? Anyone? What's the first thing that God created? Whiskers. Go, you cheated. (laughs) You looked ahead. See, the answer is not in Genesis 1. We speak of light, earth, heaven. No, no. It's in Proverbs chapter 8. Now, in Proverbs chapter 8, the style of the passage is in um, poetic terms or anthropomorphic terms. Uh, Proverbs 8 talks about wisdom. It's as if wisdom is talking to you in the first person singular. It's so impressive, as you'll see. Many people simply ascribe this, and not improperly, to Jesus Christ as being the personification of wisdom. You can look at it that way if you like. There's no problem with that. But let's look at Proverbs 8. Doth not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth in the top of high places by the way and the places of the paths. She crieth at the gates, at the, at the entry of the city and at the entrance of the doors. Unto you, O men, I call and my voice is to the sons of men. O ye simple, understand wisdom. O ye fools, be of understanding heart. Here, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be the right things. And he goes, and the, and, and the writer goes on. Now, let's pick it up about um, verse 23. You can read the, make a note to yourself to read the rest of chapter 8 at your leisure. But I want to pick up verse 23. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, and he strengthened the fountains of the deep. When he gave to the sea its decree that the water should not pass his commandment. When he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Now you can see this passage very validly, vividly, clearly as the son with the father at the creation. I wouldn't quarrel with that. Or you can stand back and say this as a style of writing, which is, but it's clearly speaking of wisdom. So what precedes the physical creation as you and I think of it? Wisdom. As we jump into James chapter 3, verse 13, where he is going to talk about wisdom. We use that word so casually, wisdom. Verse 13 asks the question, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation or more perce- or good behavior. The word conversation is the old English for what you and I, the term has come to mean something a little different in modern usage. Behavior uh, is good behavior. His works with meekness of wisdom. It's in Proverbs 4, 7 says, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. Now, most of us confuse man's knowledge with man's wisdom. There's enormous knowledge available throughout mankind. And many Christians, by overreacting to some of these injunctions we'll get into, overreact to that. No, there's much knowledge, and knowledge is to be embraced and and acquired. It's useful. However, uh, the real problem is man's wisdom. The Bible is full of examples of the folly of man's wisdom, not the folly of man's knowledge. Knowledge isn't to be despaired. Knowledge is basic. But wisdom, uh, the application of the knowledge. Let's let's just, we could spend uh, substantial time just chronicling the the follies of man's wisdom in the Scripture. Uh, Perhaps one of the earliest ones we see uh, in a a collective, in a large sense, is the Tower of Babel. They had this big uh, project which ended up in failure and confusion. Some draw a parallel between the Tower of Babel and the judgment of the nations there and the Y2K problem that's going to hit the planet Earth here in another year and a half or whatever. And uh, maybe, we'll see. Another example of man's folly was Abraham. When uh, there was a famine in the land, he fled to Egypt uh, in Genesis chapter 12. And uh, another example of the folly of man's wisdom is uh, Saul. 
when David was going to take on Goliath. He wanted David to put on his armor. It seemed logical at the time. Of course, the kid couldn't handle it, and that wasn't God's plan, so you know the story. In Acts 27, despite Paul's warning, the Roman experts insisted upon setting out to sea. And despite their uh, folly of their uh, wisdom, uh, they were saved, but they lost everything else because they didn't listen to Paul, who warned them. Anyway, man's, man's wisdom, the Bible chronicles man's wisdom, is, uh, is folly. There are three enemies you and I face. What are the three enemies we face? Anyone? The world, the flesh, and the devil. Sure. That's in Ephesians chapter 2, first three verses. You and I face three adversaries. There are three forces or elements or things that are against you. One of them, of course, is the world. And the wisdom of the world is a trap. Now, you don't want to confuse the world's knowledge and the world's wisdom. Some people figure that you know, they overreact to some of this uh, in, in, in impractical ways. Over a century ago, Henry David Thoreau warned that we had improved means to unimproved ends. That's man's dilemma. We've learned how to make bigger and bigger bombs. We haven't learned to use them better and so forth. That's sort of the flavor of it. The world, by wisdom, knew not God. That's the ultimate folly. The world has made, had many follies, but the ultimate folly is not to recognize God. And the wisdom of the world rejects the gospel of God. And that's the ultimate foolishness. In fact, God's wisdom is foolishness to man. 1 Corinthians 2.14 is a good example of that. Turn to 1 Corinthians 1. It's a, such a basic passage that I, I know we referred to it before, but let's uh, just refresh our, our perspective as the Holy Spirit speaks through Paul. First chapter of Romans, the first chapter of First Corinthians, both speak of worldly wisdom in a number of ways. But here in verse 18 of chapter 1, 1 Corinthians, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And boy, isn't it? Isn't that an absurd idea? You know, our, our worldly friends must think we're nuts. That the entire universe, everything in it, is going to be measured by an incident that occurred in Judea 2,000 years ago. The preaching of the cross, that by your attitude, your, your, your attitude towards that cross will determine your eternal destiny. By worldly standard, that's foolish. And that's exactly what God says. The, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto, unto us who are saved is the power of God. I want you to notice something about that verse. There are only two categories. Every one of us in this room are in one of those two categories. We're either among those that perish or among those that are saved. What discerns the difference between the two? Their attitude towards the cross. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, foolishness. But to us who are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Probably have just this, uh, this uh, millennium bug on our mind, perhaps, but the idea that we're moving toward the, you know, the end of this millennium, the calendar, all the computers are going to have calendar problems. Wouldn't it be ironic if God chooses to judge our high-technology culture with all its arrogance and pride by putting them in a situation where they can't figure out what day it is? Yeah, it's ironic, that's why you're laughing, and yet, how like God it would be to use that kind of foolishness to bring down the wisdom of the, the world. And then he goes on, for after that, by the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, but unto us, unto the Gentiles, foolishness. But unto them who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. What is the beginning of wisdom? Anyone know? Good for you. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. Proverbs 9.10, it's also uh, Psalm 110, uh, 111, verse 10. It's Job 28, 28. It's actually half a dozen different places in the Scripture in various ways. Romans 3, 18 says, speaking of the perishing, there is no fear of God before their eyes. 
The fear of God. You know, we, we come to Bible studies, we learn about the scripture, we do a lot of things, we learn lots of verses and we collect information. But one of the things we need to soberly focus on is, is there the fear of God in our lives? One of the most disturbing things in my own personal life, I spent 30 years as a corporate executive doing deals on an international basis, serving on many boards of directors and traveling, traveling with many, many segments of the corporate world and uh, had some wins and some losses, met some good guys, some, some bad guys, all kinds. The biggest adjustment that I had to make in the last seven years, I've taught the Bible for uh, well, about virtually 30 years as a layman, whatever, but in the last seven years, I've been doing this full time. And uh, one of the biggest adjustments is to somehow deal with the shoddy ethics that you find among Christians. I've dealt with all kinds, mostly secular executives. Many of the executives I dealt with during those 30 years, I don't know their theological position, whether they're saved or not, but you quickly determined which ones were accountable, which ones were reliable, which ones you could trust. And there's an ethic. I didn't say morality. They could have been cheating on their wives for all I know, but an ethic that you could bank on. Their word is their bomb. That was the, that was the ethic of Wall Street. And uh, the winners were, were those that protected that reputation. And uh, I won't chronicle the pathetic stories that have occurred in the last seven years dealing with, quote, Christians, close quote. It's, uh, it's been pointed out to me by one of our staff, we were just talking about this the other day, pointed out a very interesting insight is that somehow in our Christian community, people are isolated from accountability of their actions. There's forgiveness. There's a style of dealing with things that does not bring about count accountability. Uh, it's interesting. That, that's almost unique to our Christian culture. It's not characteristic of the Jewish culture. Not that there are bad guys among the Jews too, but the point is they do at least have an ethic of honesty. You don't talk about integrity and character. You don't find pulpits typically talking about integrity or character. They're talking about theological issues. And I'm not saying one's more important than the other. That's not my point. And what I'm leading up to is what's missing in the equation is a fear of God. We may know all about God. We may be praying to Him a lot. But the fear of God, the reverence for Him, the recognize that He is a participant looking over your shoulder at every transaction. When you shake hands with somebody and you say you're going to do something, God's listening. And in certain segments of our society, the parties, you know, it is expected that you honor that commitment even if it turns out later to be unprofitable. That's part of the game. It's also been pointed out to me that your fear of God does not come from your Bible studies. We're all in here together taking notes and sharing some things, and that's great. Your fear of God is a measure of your devotional life. If you run into somebody that seems to evidence a lack of reverence for God in his attitude, his day-to-day -day walk, it tells you volumes about his devotional life. And in, your, in our own case, each of us, your, your fear of God is a derivative of the sincerity and depth and commitment of your devotional life with Him. Have you spend time with Him? Well, now, where do we get our wisdom? We talk about wisdom here. Fear of God is... Well, where do we get this? Well, first of all, our wisdom is of Christ, the Scripture tells us. So our first step in getting godly wisdom is to be in Christ, to receive Him. Paul speaks of being in Christ 161 times. Check me out and see if I missed any. Second place we get wisdom is from the Word of God, Deuteronomy 6. Let's, uh, let's take a look at what our Jewish friends would be quick to point out to us. Deuteronomy chapter 6. This passage is very well known. Tishma. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord. By the way, love is not an emotion, it's a commitment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day, this day shall be in thy heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest in the, by the way, and when thou liest down, when thou risest. You know, if you were doing that, we wouldn't have these kids carrying guns to sh school, shooting their classmates and thinking that's okay. Something's missing. What's missing? These teachings in the home. Now some people uh, smile at the Jewish 
phylacteries where they bind, they literally take scriptures and put them in little boxes and wrap them on their hands and on their forehead and they go through these, these procedures. And you can smile at that as being sort of a ritualistic approach to it, but they're closer to it than we are, generally. They take it seriously. Okay, in verse uh, 2 Timothy 3, 15, Psalm 119, the longest psalm in the book of Psalms, is about getting wisdom from the Word of God. And you can read the whole psalm. But, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long one. But uh, read the verse about 97 through about 100 there, and it hits it hard. You get wisdom from the Word of God. And then there's a third, this is a review question, there's a third place that you get wisdom. You get it from by being in Christ, by being saved. You get it from the Word of God. Where's the third place? James 1 5. Do you remember? Chapter 1? By prayer. By believing prayer. And I think there's a tremendous link between your prayer life, your devotional life, and the operative attitude in terms of reverence for God. Many people that we've been dealing with in the Christian community, it's pretty obvious from the kinds of representations and the way they don't uh, honor their commitments that their prayer life, it tells me volumes about their prayer life. It's not for me to judge their intent. I can't, that's only God knows the intent of their heart. But you certainly can tell, you can certainly inspect the fruit. Anyway, verse 14. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Now, he's speaking here of evidences of this man's wisdom, false wisdom. And what does it lead to? How do you, you know, what are the evidences of false, wis, uh, of false wisdom? Well, you're going to have envy. See, ambition and boasting robs God of his glory. Is your zeal uh, for the Lord, uh, is your zeal for the Lord or is it carnal? In the Christian work, you find people who are very zealous. Are they doing it for the Lord or is there something else in there? Well, how do you tell? Well, do we rejoice when others succeed or are we filled with envy and criticism? Do we spend our time criticizing other Christians who aren't doing it quite the way we would like, that aren't emphasizing in their theology the things that we think are the most important? Do we spend our time, you know, uh, uh, slandering and libeling uh, our, 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 our fellow workers? Or do we pray for them? When others fail, are we burdened or are we glad? Big issue. Envy, one of the symptoms of false wisdom. Strife, James tells us. That's a form of self-seeking. That's a form of rivalry. That's a close cousin of what we've just been talking about. And you can read uh, Philippians 2, verses 3 and following. And Christ taught us about that. And, of course, boasting itself is evidence of pride, the original sin, the really original sin by Satan. Paul was forced to boast of his ministry, but he always did it in terms that glorified the Lord. And this is, this is one of the, the, the tight ropes we walk all the time. Because to establish credibility or to open up certain doors and channels, we tend to puff some of the things that we've done. And yet it's very dangerous ground, often misunderstood. You can do that to a certain extent to, to establish credibility in a certain context, but clearly, if it's not done carefully, it can be misinterpreted and, and the idea is it needs to always glorify God. Difficult line to walk. We need a lot of prayer in that area. And, of course, deceit. Lie not against the truth. You know what the biggest lie, biggest deceit that we're vulnerable to? All kinds of people are trying to deceive us. You know what the biggest deceit, most dangerous deceit is our own? Believing our own press releases. Easy to do. Easy to do. I've got a staff that's given me their solemn vow that if I ever start taking myself seriously at all, they will plant their shoe in the appropriate place. Okay. Of course, the, contra the, the contrast to all this is meekness. What is meekness? Power under control. Wisdom is the right use of knowledge. Meekness is the right use of power. And it seeks only the glory of God, and it doesn't cater to the praises of men. Verse 15, This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. We've been talking about man's wisdom in these things, which is earthly, sensual, and devilish. This is the source of false wisdom, and I'm fascinated with this term, which translated in your English, sensual. It's psuchikos in the Greek, which means natural or sensual. It's the word from which we get psuchi, or life, 
or soul. It's the word from which we get psychology. Psychology. There's a wonderful example of false wisdom. Now, there's much that the field of psychology can offer in terms of knowledge. But some of the um, inferences can be very, are very, very anti-biblical. Very dangerous ground. Very dangerous ground. You, you need to, you, if you study Genesis very carefully, you'll discover that the problem with Adam and Eve is they came from a dis- dysfunctional family and didn't have a loving father. And of course, I'm being facetious. That was Satan's problem, right? He wasn't understood. He had to came from, a, you know. Anyway, um, and isn't it, isn't it tragic that when Paul writes to Timothy, he didn't have the benefit of the insights of modern psychology. No, no, I, I think it's a mistake. Don't throw the whole field into the trash can. As many Christians do, they go overreact to some of this. But just recognize that much of worldly wisdom that masquerades as scientific knowledge is, is just that. It's worldly wisdom, and it's anti... It's not only non-biblical, it's anti-biblical. And the one thing that psychologists cannot deal with is the root problem in the human personality. The root problem in the human personality is guilt. And the psychologists have no remedy for guilt. They can only go through denial. And uh, the only one that has a remedy for guilt gave his life for you and I on a wooden cross 2,000 years ago. Only the Bible has an answer for the root problem of the human predicament. Psychology does not. The whole worldly wisdom issue has its origin apart from and is opposed to our new nature that's been given to us by God. Worldly wisdom is in concert with our old nature, but with our new nature, it's opposed. It's, uh, the scripture was, it'll talk here about it's wisdom from beneath. It's devilish. It's demonic. Satan's wisdom, one example of it, look at Genesis 3. It's a, it's a wisdom of deceit. You know the story. It's also summarized for you in Romans 1, but we'll move on. Verse 16, And where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Worldly wisdom always produces trouble. Wrong thinking produces wrong living. And you want some examples of that, pick up any paper. Tune in any news broadcast. Look at the lives that make up the bulk of our society. Broken homes. Confusion about the role of man and woman. Even in sight. You think that something as basic as that can be abused but not that confused. And yet look at our society and, it's, and the foolishness that pervades it. The result of worldly wisdom is pretty obvious. Pretty obvious. Verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now this is the contrast. Wisdom from above is Pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. James 1.17, remember we looked at that, uh, every good gift is from above. Remember that? Chapter 1. Every good, every good thing that happens in your life comes from where? From, comes from God. Anytime you're down, start counting the good things that are happening and give God the glory. It's amazing how the list grows. Our citizenship, of course, is in heaven, not here. Our, our home is in heaven, not here. Our affection is focused above. There's verses for all these. It'll be in the notes. What are the evidences of pure wisdom, a true wisdom? Purity is for one. It's, purity means it's chaste, free from defilement. There is an affection for the world that can make one an adulterer in the spiritual sense. There's a, a number of verses. I've got them penciled in here. Uh, yeah, Psalm 115.8 in Psalm 135.18, tells us that we become like the gods we worship. We become like the gods we worship. Is the world unforgiving? Is the world harsh and cruel? If you're too close to the world, you will become harsh, cruel, unforgiving. That's another reason to worship Christ, because what you worship is what you will become like. Another of these things that uh, James lists here is peace. See, man's wisdom leads to competition, leads to rivalry, ultimately to war. And that's what James is going to talk about in the next chapter. God's 
piece is based on holiness, not compromise. And Isaiah talks about that. William Moore, gentleness is another list on our list here. Sweet reasonableness is another way of describing gentleness. Moderation without compromise. Gentleness without weakness. Carl Sandburg described Abraham Lincoln as a man of velvet steel. I like that. Another uh, evidence of true wisdom is compliance. Being agreeable, easy to work with, yielding to <laughs> persuasion. Not a pushover, but yielding to uh, persuasion. Swift. Remember what James said in chapter 1. Some of this is review for us here. Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. One of the things that I have not taken a lot of time to build here as we go through the book is the integrity of the book. These are not scattered admonitions. Do this, don't do this. Many people treat the book that way. It looks like it at first. When you really study the book, uh, you'll discover more and more it all ties together. All these things are echoes of the foundation that, that James laid in the earlier part of the book. Now there is list here is mercy, controlled by. Be full of mercy. Be controlled by mercy. Another on this list is good fruits. The Spirit produces fruits to the glory of God. John 15, you remember the passage in John. We are instructed to be fruit inspectors, not gift inspectors. Another thing he lists here is decisiveness, singleness of mind. That's the opposite of wavering. Remember in James 1, 6, nothing gets the wavering man, double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Can your commitments be relied upon? Are you a fiduciary of those that trust you or rely on you? The word fiduciary is amazingly absent in the Christian vocabulary. And yet any lawyer, any professional executive, anyone that's an officer of a corporation, anyone that's on the board of directors of a corporation, is, should well know what the word fiduciary means. It means you place the people who are relying on you, their interest, ahead of your own. It's a very clear principle in law. There's only two kinds of relationships in the law, arm's length or fiduciary. Now, generally in life, you are not required to be a fiduciary unless you're a doctor-patient, attorney-client. Uh, there are certain relationships that are fiduciary relationships. It's spelled out that way. And an officer of a corporation is a fiduciary. That's why it should be available to most of us that have been in that kind of a practice. And the word fiduciary, the, the, the fiduciary role is one that is a critical one. You know, what the, you know what the word fiduciary is in the Greek? Koinonia. We call our, uh, our ministry Koinonia House because the word Koinonia means communication or fellowship. I was startled to discover it means a fiduciary, something that's a... If you're an employee of an employee, of, a, of an employer, you owe them 60 minutes for every hour paid, 8-hour day, 40-hour week, whatever, that's fine. If you're an, a, a, a manager or an executive, you owe them more than that. You are required, you're viewed in the law, to be an officer or a, a man. You are a fiduciary of the corporation. You have, you have a, a burden to protect its intellectual properties and its customer lists and other kinds of soft assets. You are accountable. You, you are required to protect those. What may come as a surprise, a Christian employee is required by Ephesians 6, verse 9, and other passages, to, he owes, a Christian owes their employer a fiduciary relationship because you're, you're working as to, as, uh, as to Christ. Anyway, moving on, one of the other lists here is sincerity, openness, honesty, speaking the truth in love in the terms of Ephesians and so on. Okay, verse 18. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in the peace of them that make peace. In other words, we reap what we sow. It's a very serious thing to be a troublemaker in God's family. If you're running around with man's wisdom, if you're running around with these envy, strifes, and so forth, the echoes of your misconduct will injure a lot of people, but also will offend God. It's very serious to be a troublemaker within a church. If you're going to make trouble, do it somewhere else, not in the ministry, not in the church, because you, they've got a very, very special protective boss. And one of the things God hates, according to Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19, is sowing discord among the brethren. It really is disturbing. I won't ask for a show of hands, but it's really disturbing how many fellowships have among them almost as a characteristic, some that are sowing discord among the brethren. Very disturbing. Now, what's the result of all this is chapter 4. They, you think we have troubles, you should get some idea of the kinds of problems that were in the fellowship that James attended. They apparently had fights. They apparently, <laughs> they really went at it, according to his, from his admissions. Because chapter 4, from, first part of that is how to end wars. <laughs> and you're not talking about 
you know, tanks and artillery and planes. He's talking about, you know, church meetings. Okay. <laughs> and he will lay out three kinds of people we're at war with. At war with each other. At war with ourselves. And being at war with God. Boy, it sounds crazy, doesn't it? Who would possibly do that? Well, let's see what he says about it here. Chapter 4, verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? He's talking to a Christian congregation. Yes, they're Jews. They're 12 tribes. But they, I believe that, you know, obviously they're Jewish Christians. And, and so these, these, these struggles are among Christians. Yet, I'm sure, being Jewish, they sang Hene Matov, which is uh, Psalm 133. How, how you know, uh, what a blessing it is to dwell together, right? How blessed it is for brethren to dwell together, right? <laughs> it apparently, it wasn't that much fun. <laughs> it's interesting how uh, these uh, tensions are all through the Scripture. Uh, you know, in Genesis 13, we have Lot and Abraham, where Lot chose the worldly way, and Abraham had to ultimately rescue him in chapter 14 from all that mess. The story of Absalom and David in, in 2 Samuel 13 through 18. You all know the story. Even in the New Testament, Luke 9, you get the disciples quarreling about who's going to be the biggest. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul talks about these Corinthians that were suing each other in court. And uh, I understand his logic. I happen to say, there's some, there are times that I feel the Christian community would be better off if they did sue each other. In the sense that we get some of these issues resolved. to get people held accountable for the misconduct. Because even though we're not supposed to sue in court, there was a procedure in the fellowship to deal with these issues that are rarely followed today. The lack of accountability, lack of any connection with the consequences of our action. That's the truth of the matter in many fellowships. And, and Paul talks about Galatians 5. He talks about the Galatians devouring one another. And even in Ephesians, he, in chapter 4, he exhorts them to unity. So these are, these are not unique to us. It's obviously something that the Holy Spirit gives us a lot of information and, of course, there's all kinds. We can go ahead and spend a lot of time on, on defining the different kinds of agreements. There's class wars, rich, poor, whatever. We divide the congregation into demographics, and they'll all have different, you know, you know how that goes. And in our society, it's tragic. There are no Americans anymore. Right after the Second World War, America, there were Americans because we had a shared national experience. But in the 50 years or whatever, the power brokers have split. You don't have Americans anymore. You've got rich, poor, black, white, men, women. Anything they can find to divide demographically and pit one against another for their own purposes. You have labor wars, you know, labor and management. You're familiar with all those. They had the same thing. You can find uh, there's verses for all of these things. Fights in the church, personal wars of all kinds. But in the interest of keeping moving here. It's interesting that uh, in verse 1 he used the term, From whence come wars and fights among you, come they not hence, even from your lusts that war in your members. The word lust there in the Greek is hedone. It's the word from which we get the word hedonism, uh, desires for pleasure. Hedonism is the belief that pleasure is the chief good in life. And it would be very disturbing, I think, for us to, to really reflect and analyze our own behavior, how often we make choices by what's the most pleasurable. It's interesting that the tasks or the assignments or things that really aren't that much fun, we defer. Confrontations aren't fun. So it's very, very typical in business as well as in the ministry to avoid confrontations, avoid dealing with an exhortation or a, or a situation that needs some handling. We, we make even our subtle decisions as well as our major decision on a pleasure basis. We may not admit it. We'll, we'll dignify it with other labels, but that's probably at the root of it. Now, what's the pathology of this trouble? Where does it come from? What's the start? Verse 2. He's, James says, Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war. Yet ye have not because ye ask not. Of course, the root problem here is selfishness. The root problem here is selfishness. And uh, that's what Isaiah says in Isaiah 53, 6. For all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to whose way? Our own way. That's the root problem. The root problem. We find that, you remember, Abraham lied about Sarah. She was actually, it was only a half lie. He said, tell them, you're my sister. Well, she was. Half sister. But the, it was still a lie because of what he was trying to protect his own life by doing that. And uh, remember after the Battle of Jericho, Achan, at the Battle of Ai, takes some stolen loot. See, so again, what's, what's at the root of all of this? A self-centeredness, a selfishness. So what's the remedy for this? 
Ye, ye ask and have not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your own lusts. See, even their praying was wrong. Even their praying was really covetousness. Interesting. Selfish people are always unhappy people. Selfish people are always unhappy people. Yet how, how hard it is to learn that. Verse 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. One of the questions we should be asking ourselves, are any of us becoming too friendly with God's enemies? Well, let's take a look at these enemies. The first enemy of God is the world. And by that it means the cosmos, the world system. We need to discern that because everything of the world, what do you mean of the world? The world system, the satanic system. Now, Abraham was a friend of God. James mentioned that in chapter 2, verse 23, you may recall. Lot was the friend of the world. And, of course, <laughs> Abraham had to come and ultimately rescue him. And friendship with the world leads to loving the world and being conformed to the world and being condemned with the world. Our souls are yet saved as by fire, as 1 Corinthians 3 uh, mentions. Friendship with the world is compared in the Scripture with adultery. I could say, how many of you are guilty of adultery? I might get some interesting hands, but probably all of us have to put our hands up if for no other reason, then um, we are married to Christ if we're Christians, and yet if we're friendly with the world, that's a form of adultery. And that's really the way the Scripture teach it, it deals with it, Romans 7, 4 and elsewhere. And we need to be faithful to Christ, which means that uh, we cannot be friendly to the world system. This model of the believer, or of God's people being married to him, is an Old Testament idea. It's in Jeremiah, 20, uh, Jeremiah 3, first five verses. It's in Ezekiel 23, the whole chapter virtually, and the first couple of chapters of Hosea. Israel was portrayed as the wife of Yahweh. The church is portrayed as the virgin bride of Christ. Not the same thing, but a very parallel kind of idiom or concept. And James continues his logic here. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, verse 5, that the spirit dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Again, that's the false wisdom. See, that's all, that's all tied together. Okay. The second enemy of God is the flesh. And this is not the body. There's nothing wrong with the body. It serves its purpose. What is, when it says the flesh, it's referring to the old nature. When we sin against, uh, when we sins of the flesh, grieve the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, verses 6 and 7. Deal with that in depth. Verse 6. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And there again, we have the, uh, the, the root manifestation of the flesh is pride. And uh, the, the antidote for that is humility. And we get humility through God's grace, not by some feigned self-abasement. Uh, well, we talked about the world, the flesh, and the third one we listed before was the devil. The devil is the one that introduced pride. He's the one that introduced a contrary will to the will of God in the universe through his own pride saw Adam's arrival and saw to it that Adam and Eve fell through his deceit. But it was through his pride that he fell. We learned that from Isaiah 14. We've done this before, but it's probably important enough and fundamental enough that we should just take, let's just part quickly and refresh that. Isaiah, there's two passages that chronicle the career of Satan, uh, his origin. And uh, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 are the two chapters, that are easy to remember, they're both a heptatic, they're both a multiple of seven. But uh, Isaiah uh, 14 is a passage that, um, in a primitive sense, is directed to uh, the king of Babylon, but clearly the language pierces beyond the immediate context and goes cosmic on us. <laughs> and uh, verses 12 through 17 are the classic passage on the origin of Lucifer. The Holy Spirit tells us in verse 12, How art thou, the, the, the passage directed to uh, Lucifer? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of morning, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which is weak in the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart. That's where sin always starts. It's in the heart. The rest is just mechanics. It starts in the heart. Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend unto heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north. 
I will ascend upon the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. It's going to go on. It's kind of interesting. It doesn't say that he wants to be God. He wants to be like God. I have this conjecture in the back of my mind that when Adam was created, Satan saw him as a rival. A rival. Interesting. The first person singular. Boy, that should be a very cautious pronoun to use. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Pride. What's his destiny? Verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to the Sheol, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man who made the earth to tremble? Who did shake the kingdoms? Who made the world like a wilderness and destroyed its cities? Who opened not the house of his prisoners? Whew. Some prophecy in there, not only of his destiny, but we see some other side effects here. Is this the man that caused the earth to tremble? Which did shake the kingdoms? who made the world like a wilderness and destroyed its cities and opened not the house of his prisoners? Whew. Satan, the devil. He introduced pride and it's his chief, deceit is his chief weapon. 1 Timothy 3.6 and also Ephesians 4.27, neither give place to the devil. Now, so how do we do all this? That sounds good, those of getting back to James here. We're down to verse 7. And we're going to make it. We have three instructions from James as how to deal with this. First, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The word submit there, by the way, is a military term in the Greek. It means to get into your proper rank. Know your place. Get where you belong. Don't be a usurper, in other words. First, you submit yourself to God. Second, verse 8. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Purify meaning to make chaste. So you submit to God and draw close to Him, and He'll draw close to you. Verse 3, I mean, excuse me, the third uh, element is to humble yourselves before God. As follows, verse 9. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Well, that's a strange instruction. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into heaven. What he means is sin is no laughing matter. We wink at that. We joke about it. We all fall into that trap. We need to repent of that when it happens. Sin is no laughing matter. God never winks at sin. There is no trivial sin in the scripture. There's some obviously heavier than others, but there is still no trivial sin. God hates sin. And that's the problem. And we need to submit ourselves to Him, draw near to Him, and humble ourselves before Him. Turn your joy into heaviness. You want to know how spiritual you are? You're going to grow and grow in spirituality. Great. How do you measure it? How do you measure your spirituality? How much do you hate sin? When you hate sin the way God does, then you're getting closer, huh? Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. Don't we love to sing that? Let's sing it with our hearts, though. God hates pride. Proverbs 6, we talked about that, 16 through 17. In Psalm 51, 17, David's famous prayer of repentance over Bathsheba, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Verse 11, speak not evil to, of one another, brethren. In other words, brothers, do not slander one another, is what it says. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother, speaketh evil of the law, judges the law. He that thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. I don't know why it is that Christians always form their firing squads in circles. There are more newsletters, more web pages, more expose books written against the brethren by other brethren. And the last brethren should probably be in quotation marks. It's a commonly observed mystery by both secular and our Jewish observers. Christians seem to spend so much time nitpicking and libeling and slandering each other, that it's a tragedy. The Jews disagree among themselves. They always say you got two Jews, you got three opinions. You know, they divide among themselves. But through thousands of years of trying to survive, they learn to close ranks. Their theological disputes tend to evaporate when there's a knock on the door. We don't do that. We got all kinds of Christians and good guys publishing to the open secular world all the uh, the real or imagined nits and gnats of somebody who, whatever. Anyway, moving on. Verse 12. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? 
Now we get into another subject that's a, a shift here, but it's an important one. I'll try to do it so we can finish the chapter. I think we will. And that has to do with planning. There's a lot of over-planning in the minds of James, and yet many Christians overreact to James' injunctions. And we're trying to see if we can't strike a balance here of what's going on. I want you to remember that Pharaoh was troubled by a series of bad dreams. And through the wisdom of God, as manifested through Joseph, God used those warnings of the impending famines for them to prepare themselves. Pharaoh had a, a series of dreams. Each one, the idioms were different, but each one basically had the, the idea that there were going to be seven good years and seven bad years. And Joseph, the wisdom of God, now that's the knowledge. The wisdom was, let's use the good years to prepare for the bad years. And that changed the course of, you know, and Joseph became the prime minister of Egypt, put in a 20% tax. Very skillful administration that uh, made Egypt, made it very effective. So, now, how do we apply that? Where is the safest place for you to be? Everybody comes because of all the various threats on the horizon, people coming to you, Chuck, where shall I flee to? You know, shall I, shall I leave Manhattan and come to Coeur d'Alene? No, 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 no. Coeur d'Alene is cold in the winter. We don't tell, we don't tell them how nice We keep a secret. Uh, <laughs> no, no, seriously, people say, Chuck, where shall I go? The answer to where you should flee is obvious. Where is the Holy Spirit leading you to minister? The safest place in the world is to be right where God wants you, wherever that is. You don't want to be anywhere else. And unless he calls you clearly, he wants you to bloom where you're planted. Now, many people fear, we say, you should follow the will of God. You get nervous because you don't really realize that God's will is better for you than you have any idea. Your unwillingness to, to accept the will of God is your doubt that his interest is in your interest. It's a lack of trust. Psalm 33, 11 says, The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. His counsel, his will comes from where? Where does God's will come from? From his heart. What's God's heart towards you? Boy, I love Jeremiah 29. I can remember I was just beginning to sense the dark valley that was coming. And it happened that I attended a graduation ceremony up at a, one of our daughters was a, at Monte Vista Christian Academy up in Northern California. And they had a graduation ceremony. But the graduation ceremony, they had a, a verse, a life verse up on the stage. And Jeremiah 29, 11. And I, they thought it was for the graduating class. But I remember almost weeping because I knew that was for me. Because I knew what was forthcoming, which took us through our valley. But For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, plans for your welfare, and not for harm, to give you a future and a hope. And indeed he has. Verse 13. Go now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go to such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. He's talking about here people who make plans. See, but our, te- our plans need to be tempered with the realization that only God really knows the future. That doesn't mean we shouldn't plan and forecast, but we should do so with caution and with a, with a footnote, as God wills, as you'll put out here. Verse 14, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appear for a little time and then vanish the way. Now, see, what we're going to deal now is the foolishness of ignoring the will of God by making our own plans in contrast to His. That's what he's talking about. And there's going to be four elements of that foolishness. The first is the brevity of our life. And boy, you could make up a dozen references from Psalms and elsewhere. I would pick a few from Job here. Job 7, 6. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. A few verses later, as the cloud is consumed and vanished away, so he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. Verse Job 8, 9. For we are but of yesterday and know nothing because our days upon the earth are a shadow. Job 9, 25. Now my days are swifter than a post. They flee away and they see no good. Now his, his post, postmen were faster than ours, I think, because he's, he's trying to make a point of being swift, but I won't, I won't beat up on that one. Um, now my days are swifter than a post. They flee away and they see no good. See, life is but a quick snapshot. A relative of mine pointed out, you don't grow old. You wake up one day and discover you are, you know. We count our years each birthday, right? That's unscriptural because God says we should number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom, Psalm 90, 12. Now, it's interesting. I used to use this on executives when I was in that world. If you say, uh, you, know, uh, you know, how many years do you think you have left? You can actuarially make a calculation. You know, you figure, well, 70 years, and I'm, if a guy is 40 years old, I've got 30 years left, or whatever the numbers are, okay? What I used to do, that's abstract. See, if, I, if you think, gee, I've got 20, 30, 40 years, whatever, in front of me, that's an abstraction. 
nothing concrete about that. I used to ask him, how many weekends you got left? The way I used to put it is, hey, uh, Bernie, you got uh, about 1,500 weekends left. <laughs> what? You know, well, do your own arithmetic, you know. Uh, what you do is take uh, three score and ten, that's the scripture, but roughly 70, and, and an insurance agent, they write, that's a good estimate, 70, you know, 70 years still. Three score and ten. Subtract your age from that and multiply by 52. I'd multiply 50 to keep the arithmetic simple, but, uh, you know, so if you're 30, you've got about 2,000 weekends left, no problem. <gasps> 2,000, you know, that, that sounds kind of finite. You know, I'd see him a few years later and say, oh, what do you got, about uh, 1,100 left? And, uh, you know. I met this one financier many years later, I think seven or eight lawsuits later, uh, not by me, but federal lawsuits, uh, and uh, haven't run into him. And he came up to me. I've got 900, don't I, Chuck? I mean, he's been counting, you know. <laughs> he remembered that silly crack when we were just, you know, in a, in a boardroom context, kidding things around. So our life is short, very brief. It's important to us because it's in front of us, and yet it's trivial compared to eternity, and yet our eternity is determined by how we handle what God has put before us in, these, in this brief span. See, and what we, should, we can make plans, but what we, should, what we ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live or do this or that. And it should be the constant attitude of our lives, of our heart. And a lot of verses, I'll spray that for a short review here. How do we determine the will of God? The will of God is a living relationship between the God and believer. It's not a, it's not a definitive thing like you, you know, read X, Y, or Z. It's a relationship. The will of God is a relationship. And because it's a relationship, it itself is a growing experience. Colossians 1.9 says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. It's a growth experience, in other words. And he wants us to understand his will. Ephesians 5.17, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. We must also, we're instructed to prove his will. Romans 12.2, her book, be transformed is a, a, a development of the first two verses of Romans 12. Verse 2 of Romans 12, 1 and 2 is, Be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may what? Prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You are to prove His will. Now, the Greek verb there means to prove by experience. You learn and you, you prove His will by experiencing it. It's an interactive, growing thing. You work at it. Now, people keep asking, how do I determine God's will for my life? If they're announcing that way, well, they're admitting that they never tried it. John 7, 17, if any man will do my will, he shall know of the doctrine and so forth. And uh, Matthew eleven twenty nine, The whole idea of God's will is to take that which you know is his will and obey it, and he will incrementally reveal more. You're grow, it's a growth path. It's a, it's a baby step, you know, crawl, walk, run situation. And, of course, the secret, we said, selfish people are never happy people. The secret of a happy life is to delight in duty. The secret of a happy life is... Many people find fulfillment by serving others in hospitals or in elderly homes or whatever in some ministry because that's fulfilling. And it seems like a, you know, a strange thing to people who haven't experienced it to understand that. But that's the secret of happiness. It, it, it can be the mother for her family, whatever. But the ultimate thing, of course, is to delight in your duties to God. That's the ultimate happiness. Work is a kind of prayer when you're home. If you're a tenant farmer killing somebody else's family, that's, that's sort of the brow stuff. But you're at home, that's a form of prayer. Psalm 119, verse 54 says, Thy statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. And if God can't rule, by the way, He overrules. If God can't rule, He'll overrule. And His chastening of you is evidence of His love. And that's a whole other thing. But the other things that cause us, should give us caution when we plan is not just the brevity of life. It is the complexities of life. Life is complicated. I don't have to de develop that. You understand that. They're the uncertainties of life. Everybody likes to quote uh, uh, Luke 12. Uh, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. That doesn't mean you don't plan the futurity of today's decisions. Planning is not forecasting. Planning is to deal with the futurity of, day, of today's decisions. If you're managing an inventory, I think you need to plan. And this has often caused many Christians not to plan. Big mistake. Uh, Thomas Kempis says, uh, Man proposes, but God disposes. Solomon said, The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. Proverbs 16.33. What that tells you is there's no such thing as randomness. 
And it really fascinates me to discover there are two concepts in mathematics that don't exist. One is infinity. We use it mathematically. But if you look through a telescope, we know the universe has an end. It's, not, it's finite, not infinite. That's embarrassing. It has all kinds of problems cosmologically. That's why you get to the Big Bang models and all that stuff. You go the other way, in the, in the microscopic sense, you think that if you take a line and cut it in half, whatever's left, you can cut in half again. Whatever's left, you, you think you can do that forever. No, you can't. When you get down to 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, it no longer exists. The universe is digital. It's quant That's what they mean by quantum physics. Because you can't infinitely divide length, mass, time, or energy. Divide an hour into 60 minutes, divide 60 minutes into 60 seconds, take a second, start cutting it up into small pieces. When you get down to 10 to the minus 43 seconds, you are, you, you're, you're over. Below that, it not only is no longer an object, it's all local. All particles in the universe they now discover are immediately connected. It's impossible. It's a whole different model of the universe because uh, uh, that's what they mean by quantum physics. And, uh, and Neil, Neil, uh, Niels Bohr said, uh, anyone that isn't shocked by quantum physics doesn't understand it. That's why one of the physicists committed suicide. He couldn't handle it, what, the implications of all of that. But it works. And it works. That's why we have the advances we have. But the point is, there is no such thing as infinity up or down. There's another issue, randomness. We talk about random chance. We have random, we have random variables in mathematical equations, but we now learn that there is no real randomness. That's what's led to the whole, a new field of mathematics called chaos theory. That's what they call it. But basically is an elaboration of the, is a, of the fact that there is nothing that is truly random. Well, that's what the Bible said all along. Okay. Anyway, and of course the last thing is the frailty of man. He says, verse 16, but, but ye rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil, if you're rejoicing in your boastings. Now, there's a caveat to all of this that I also want to say, and that is that this all can be easily misapplied. It can be a cop-out from responsibility. I'm not going to plan, you know, the Lord's going to take care of me. You know, does the Lord brush your teeth every morning? In other words, there's certain things you do to take care of yourself. And if the Lord tells, tells, you, tells Pharaoh through Joseph, there's going to be seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine, oh we better do something about it, Okay? a lot of freeway traffic and you're across the street, I do suggest you look around and plan. Okay? <laughs> I, should have, I should have really opened with the story about the rooster and the chicken. I'm going to cross the road. Right? The, rooster said, the chicken's going to cross the road. The rooster says, if you are, i got two pieces of advice. Do it quickly and lay it on the line. <laughs> okay? So I'm trying to do that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Christian walk is not a flight from prudence. Scripture says the prudent see danger and take refuge, the simple keep going and suffer for it, and it says that several times. And Jesus also said, Which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? There is an appropriate role of planning, and yet it's all done if God wills. That's the point that James is making. It's not a flight from prudence or, or rational management. What we do need to do is seek the Lord's will in everything we undertake, however trivial, however we should seek the Lord's will in it. And if you disobey the Lord's will, it's uh, the last, verse 17, Therefore to him that doeth, uh, knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So if you know what the Lord's will is in your life and don't do it, that's sin. Well, what is the Lord's will? There's probably a lot of things you're not sure of. But I can give you a list of ten things it's quite clear on back in Exodus 20. Okay, and there are other places that you know you can quickly determine a number of places in your life where you know, and you start obeying the Lord's will. The rest He'll reveal to you. Now, the big problem, of course, the last question I'd like to answer, then we'll wrap it up. Why do people deliberately disobey God? You can understand people who don't believe God, you know, atheists. That's a whole other problem. We're, not, we're talking about Christians. Why do Christians deliberately obey God? For one thing, is a worldly wisdom, and I'm going to use as an expression of that a poem that most of us had to learn when we were in school. And it's extolled as a great poem. It's called Invictus by William Ernest Henley. And as a piece of poetry, it's quite elegant, but listen carefully what he's saying. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced or cried aloud. Under the bludgings of circumstance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged the punishments, the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Quite a moving poem. But it's wrong. It's the source of an attitude that leads to disaster. 
And Dorothea Day wrote a parody of this poem that I just thought we'd close on. It's called My Captain. Out of the light that dazzles me, bright as the sun from pole to pole, I thank the God I knew to be for Christ, the conqueror of my soul. Since his, the sway of circumstance, I would not wince nor cry aloud under the rule that which men call chance. My head, with joy, is humbly bowed. Beyond this place of sin and tears, that life with him and his the aid, despite the menace of the years, keeps and shall keep me unafraid. I have no fear, though straight the gate. He cleared the punishments from the scroll. Christ is the master of my fate. Christ is the captain of my soul. Praise God. Dorothea Day. Let's close with a word of prayer. Stand for a word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we praise you that your wisdom is available to us for the asking. We thank you, Father, that you have provided our wisdom in Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Father, that you have provided your wisdom in your word that is here in our arms. And we thank you too, Father, that we have a 24-hour hotline to your throne room, that your wisdom is available for the asking. That, Father, we would indeed ask that you would help us to walk moment by moment in Christ. Help us, Father, to reverence you, to fear you, as a continual moment-by-moment attitude. Father, we would ask that you would draw us ever closer into fellowship in our private devotions. We thank you, Father, for these opportunities to assemble. We thank you, Father, for the teachings that are available in such abundance in our land. But above all, Father, we thank you that we can have time with you privately, personally, daily. That we indeed might be ever conscious that you're an unseen participant in every deal we make, every hand that we shake, every commitment we utter, every opportunity that presents itself. We pray, Father, for discernment that we might, among those opportunities, discern those that represent your mandate, for we know that not all opportunities are mandate, Father. But we would ask through your Holy Spirit, you'd give us discernment. We pray, Father, through your Holy Spirit that you would illuminate our path, that we might indeed pursue pursue boldly that which you have for us in the days ahead. We pray, Father, you'd help each of us to discover that specific will, that specific mission, that specific ministry that you would have of each of us, that we each might be more fruitful for your kingdom, that we each might be more pleasing in thy sight as we commit ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we do pray. Amen.